Okay, light. Why do we need light? Why do we need to understand light? Why do we need to understand atoms and matter? Well, we're trying to understand the universe, where we came from, what it's all about, what's out there, what's going on. This is a model of a galaxy. It's supposed to be Milky Way, but you know it's wrong. Uh, close, spiral. Each individual dot, stars, billion stars or whatever, we're one of them, about halfway out from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It's spinning around, and here we are. We learned about our hood, our solar system. We know that we can get to moon and back, and we can even send people if we want to put the resources towards doing that. Getting out to our solar system with people, that's quite difficult. We can send robotic probes though out to our solar system, so we know about that. But that's it. We can't even get to the next star, the next closest little star dot. So that's pretty crazy. These distances are hard to even imagine. And so we talk about our galaxy. What about other galaxies? I mean, we look up at the night sky and we can see stars that are close to us. And we only see the big stars, the bright stars that are close to us. The dimmer stars, they're just too dim to see with our eyes. With telescopes, we can see them. So we don't see a whole lot with our eyes. Or again, with telescopes, we get to see more, but we can't even go there. So in fact, how do we know about stars or galaxies? All we can do is look. All we can do is gather the light, break it down, and figure out what it's telling us. So we need to understand light, the basics of light. Okay, matter versus light. Atoms, you, me, anything made up of atoms. Okay, good old Democritus had this idea way back, right? But now we know a lot more, we've got equipment, we can take measurements, and we've got a, a better sense of what atoms are. And we're going to get a quick tour here. So atoms, well, at the center, called the nucleus, we've got protons and neutrons. Just go with it for now, don't overthink it. And then around them are electrons. Now these guys have about 2,000 times more mass than the electrons. Really, 1,800, you want to be picky? You can be pickier than that, too. But these guys somehow bind together. Now, another principle, we're getting up on stars. We're going to start understanding stars. So keep in mind, remember that electrons love protons. So electrons come flying by. If they don't go too fast, they can get caught, and they go kind of in, a, in orbit. Okay? But protons hate protons. Get them close together, they push apart farther apart. Get them close enough, and they do snap together and fall in love. Okay? Now the role of neutrons, we won't get into this too much because it gets to be too much, but neutrons help. They're kind of like counselors. They help bind the protons and keep them together. Okay. But what, what about light? What's light? I mean, that's matter. What's light? Can I turn on light? It's light. Can I catch some? Can I put it in my pocket? What is it? I mean, what, what is light? It's really weird. You know, who would have the gall to think of that question? What, what is light? Light's bouncing off me right now. If I turn off the lights, hopefully I'm not going visibly light. What is light? So let's talk about that. And what we know about light. Let's go through over here this column here. What do we know about light? We know that something makes it like a light bulb or a star or you know, some hot plate, hot metal, a candle. Something makes light. And the light goes outward from that thing. Okay? And it can bounce off of things. The light from the light bulb bounces off of me and you get to see it. We know that it travels very fast, the fastest speed, faster than matter can travel. Electrons can't travel. They can get, you can get them up close, but they can't get them to the speed of light. So we call the speed of light often C for constant. Um, and there's a lot of subtlety that we're going over, so we're just getting a taste of this now. Right. So light travels very fast. Now you can look up in the, in the coach and see the number. We'll talk about how fast it is, but it's incredible. If you were to take a light pipe, and go from San Francisco across the same latitude to Washington, D.C., that would take 0 0.01 seconds. That's one one hundredth of a second. That's crazy. Light could go from here to moon in a little over a second, about 1.3 seconds. And so when light hits, the sunlight hits moon, then it'll bounce off and it takes about a second, 1.3 seconds, to get to us. So it, just to get a sense, it's crazy. To travel 93 million miles, light takes eight minutes. That's pretty fast. Right? So we'll talk about how fast. You can look up the number, but it doesn't mean anything. It's just too crazy. But we start to get a sense, wow, I can go across the United States in a hundredth of a second. That's the kind of usually on a 
on a stopwatch, that's the smallest thing. That's the thing going as fast as you can imagine. From here, DC, boom. So why do you think we get information so quickly on the internet? You can get something from, uh, you know, so from some country across the globe, bam, like that. So that's interesting, it's related. Okay, so, but what is light? People pondered this for quite a while, right? I mean, you couldn't even begin to approach this. You need all kinds of careful equipment. To get the speed of light, Galileo said, hey, go over there on the mountaintop. You take a lantern, okay? And when you open it and close it, and I see it, I'll open and close mine. We'll time how long that takes, and it, it didn't work. It didn't even come close. Light's way too fast. But they did do some clever experiments, and they figured that out. And the question came up, too, and, and Newton was studying motion, but he was thinking about light, too. Like, what, what is the sunlight coming through my window? Is it a bunch of particles, little bits, like a dust storm, grains, little particles going, traveling along at this crazy speed? Or is it a wave of some sort? And I'm just going to give you a quick answer, both. Uh, the way it works out, keeping it short, and you can explore more if you like, is that light floats like a wave and stings like a particle. That is, if we describe light, we have to describe it going around things, going passing through openings and so on as a wave. But when it hits things, it behaves as a particle. Now, this isn't obvious. It wasn't obvious to Newton. Newton thought it was a bunch of particles. And why? Because he reasoned that if you take water waves through an opening, and there's a, some barrier here, and the water waves are coming in here like this, and the water waves are coming in, and when they go through that opening, they tend to fan out. They go like that. Okay, they fan out like that. And he noticed that if you stand at a door or a window, sunlight doesn't do that. Sunlight comes straight on through. So he said, oh, it's got to be particles because waves fan out like that. What he didn't know, and they didn't have the ability to do, is you know, they tried to make it smaller, didn't see it. Try to make it smaller, they didn't see it. But they didn't have the ability to make it so small that you start seeing light do that. If you make a narrow, narrow gap, because light is special, it's pretty crazy. So it does fan out. And so in the 1700s, they saw this experiment and they said, wait a minute. Huygens, you heard that name, with uh, going to Titan, that mission. It's a wave. It's a wave. It's fanning out. It shows all these principles of waves. And then, just to give you a, a short story, get a sense of this, how crazy this is. What is it? I mean, you look at it, you can't tell what it is. Is it a wave? Is it a bunch of particles? Well, Einstein knew of this experiment where he shined light on metal, and, me and that knocks electrons off of the matter, and you look at it and you adjust things like how bright it is and what color it is, and you look at what you get. It's called the photoelectric effect. So without explaining that too much, Einstein knew about that experiment, but no one knew what it said, and he figured out, wait a minute, when it hits, it's behaving like a particle. In fact, he got his Nobel Prize for that photoelectric effect, published in 1905. Background information, okay? What we need to get out is these properties of a wave. What is light? It's kind of fun to think about, light. Okay, so let's go over here and talk about a wave property, the anatomy of a wave. We've talked about earthquake waves a little bit, we've talked about waves, so just a couple of quick things. This is just an intro. So a wave is a traveling oscillation. It travels at a certain speed, and it oscillates at a certain frequency, and a certain amplitude, large amplitude, small amplitude. Okay. A fast oscillation is a high frequency. A slow oscillation is a low frequency. Okay, those are terms to know. Let's take a look at that. You can make a wave, you can make a wave with a slinky. Low frequency, high frequency. So you might have that, you can try it with a string. You can also do this with a uh, wave machine if you happen to have one in your back pocket. Low frequency. High frequency. Notice that the wave travels at a certain speed. And the oscillation is going like this. So I can see high frequency, low frequency. Okay, cool. Also notice 
that that oscillation can have a low amplitude, not very tall, or a high amplitude. Okay, that's all you need. You don't need to overthink that too much. But when we talk about wave properties, we talk about these terms. And let's put those together and see what we get. You might have noticed something there. All right. So I've got an oscillation with a certain frequency. It's the rate of oscillation, the speed of oscillation, if you will, and an amplitude. The amplitude is high, how high up from the middle, how, high, how far down from the middle. And then I go with the speed. And what happens if I oscillate and travel? Well, if I oscillate back and forth at a certain frequency, and then I travel, I get away. So I put those two together and I get away. Now what, what shows up? Oh, wait a minute. If I go from here to here, that's one full wave. Call that the peak of the crest. Anyway, that is the wave length, or the length of one wave. Now you can take it from the bottom. We call that the trough to the trough. We don't need that so much. Or you can take it from here, but that's not a wave. That's only one hump or half a wave. You've got to go the full wave, so that would be from here to here. Anyway, you can take it from any point. One wavelength. Now, how do we draw that? We draw it like an X without that part. And if you want to get fancy, you kind of go make a little curvy, an X with the out, without the upper right hand. That is the Greek letter lambda for length, L. It's a Greek L. OK, anyway, that's just the symbols that we use. So we've got wavelengths that can be shorter and longer. Frequency suffices, though. We can talk about the frequency and the wave speed. So let's talk about those real quickly, uh, just to get a sense of these. Let's talk about sound and light, because sound is a wave. Now, sound is a wave that goes back and forth like this, okay? But it's a wave. And you've got light, which is a wave, but you can't really tell so much. Here's some sound. And it's traveling. There's a vibration, which vibrates the air. And the air oscillates and travels to the microphone. OK, cool. So sound. Let me see. If I change the amplitude of sound, what do you think that, that is if I make the sound wave taller as it travels to you versus not as big an amplitude, what is that going to change? Well, let's see. More amplitude, louder. What about light? If this light wave, it's a different kind of thing. More amplitude, did you guess? Brighter. Now, it's true, light isn't all visible. It can be non-visible, too, but brighter in a certain sense in terms of what's collected. You see, sound and light are very different. So a radio station here. They're between. I mean, that goes on Bravo. Modern family. All right, so what's happening? Well, light wave is being sent from the radio station. It's a radio wave, non-visible light wave. It's collected here. It goes through the electric, electrical circuitry here, and I can tune it to pick up certain frequencies. Then that oscillates the speaker, and that makes the air move. So light wave is the radio wave. Through the electronics here, I can create a moving speaker, and that moves the air and sound wave. So they're very different. Let's take continue to look. Amplitude is loudness, amplitude is brightness for sound. What about frequency? If I change the frequency, well, higher frequency, higher frequency, higher pitch. Okay, higher pitch. Low frequency, low pitch. Higher frequency, higher pitch. So what's happening is the rate at which it's wiggling. All right. <laughs> anyway, that's not, uh, that's not our main focus, but it's kind of nice to contrast these two. Light. Now, what's light? 
higher frequency, light hits your eye, does it make your head wiggle? No, you can't really tell. You gotta do these experiments and run it through these slits and things like that and see how it spreads out. So a higher frequency, uh, that changes the color. So we're gonna see how this is related. Um, in fact, a higher frequency visibly would be like violet. A lower frequency would be like red. It's good old Roy G. Biv. What's lower than red? Well, it's inferior to red or infrared. What's higher than violet? And so frequency has to do with color for visible light. And I can write that just here. Color, but that's for visible. All right, what about speed? Just real quickly. Uh, speed, speed of sound. Well, that's approximately 700 miles an hour. Again, it depends on certain factors and density, temperature, things like that can affect it. About 700 miles an hour. At a latitude of about 38 degrees, say San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Earth spins. And due to the spin, we're traveling at 700 miles an hour. At the equator, you travel about 1,000 miles an hour. The air comes with you. but that's pretty fast, 700 miles an hour, right? What's the speed of light? Well, you can look it up. But that's about a million times more, or a million times faster than sound. Very close to a million times faster than sound. So that's crazy. All right. So. What's all this got to do with it? The thing that we need to know, we're gonna to need to know what the light is telling us. We're gonna take the light, we've gotta gather it with telescopes, we've gotta break it down with all our electronic instruments that people have done, and computer programs and all that stuff like that. But it's gotta tell us something. One of those fundamental things that we need to know about light is the energy. So to finish this short intro up, energy, you can think of as the ability to cause change. Uh, more energy, you can turn your bread into toast. Uh, you can burn your skin, you can uh, make someone hurt, or you can heal someone, or you can do any sort of change. That's, think about that energy. More energy, you can do more stuff, all right? So when I'm talking about waves, any kind of wave, but we're focusing on light, what would give me more energy? More energy. Well, hint, hint, it's what we were talking about. Is a low amplitude or a high amplitude more energy? Well, it takes more energy to do that than it does that. So, more amplitude. For sound, if it's louder, it'll hurt your ears, right? And you can use sound to do things. So that makes sense. For light, if it's brighter, it can hurt your eyes. So yeah, it's got more energy. Now what else? And this is the key. What has more energy, low frequency or high frequency? Just try it, it takes more energy to create it. Okay, so more frequency. And this idea is going to be critical for us as we study uh, light and energy and interpret the stars and see what it's telling us. So we'll get on to more of that stuff uh, later.